Welcome to Econ Roots. In today's episode, recorded at the APEE conference in Cancun 2023, we are proud to be joined by Professor of History of Economic Thought, Methodology of Economics and Theory of Entrepreneurship at the University of Torino, Gian Domenica Becchio. She's currently working on her book about marriage theory within classical liberalism and the history of economic thought. We are very happy she took the time out to talk to Stefan. Thank you so much for sitting down to me. I know you're very busy here. You just did one conference with the Liberty Fund and now we have Abby. But I think your work is extremely fascinating and I know many people, especially in Denmark, is very interested to know um, some of the insights that you have. So, should we just get started? Of course. Perfect. So the first question I have, in what way does rational choice relate to issues of gender? So, um, yes, the the first time that the, the rational choice theory was applied to gender issues in economics was uh, Becker's mm-hmm. work. So the role of Becker in um, dealing with gender issues within the economic theory is fundamental. So what did he do? It, it, it do. So he applied... Um, so-called mainstream economics, neoclassical economics, which is grounded on rational choice theory in order to uh, describe, explain and the uh, so-called gender inequality or better say the gap uh, between men and women in uh, economic, economic matters yeah. such as labor, wages, uh, education, entrepreneurship, everything that is related with uh, the economic matter can be explained through economic theory. So what Becker did was to apply rational choice theory to gender inequality. So to these differences between men and women. And in, he started it in uh, trying to explain gender, the so-called gender wage gap. So that was re- you know, regarded as a form of discrimination in the labor market regarding to wages. So um, that was a part of the application of human capital theory to gender issues, according to Becker. So the idea of Becker was the following. There is a difference in education between men and women. Traditionally, women have been educated to take care uh, of the family. So when they, uh, when we think about their um, possible, the possibility for them to get a job, we are thinking about some special sectors, such as care, health, and so forth. These sectors are less remunerative than other sectors, which are traditionally much more mastery. Mm-hmm. Uh, men have been traditionally educated in getting a job, at getting a, an education and then a job in these much more remunerative re- sectors. So this, this um, made a huge difference in education between men and women. This is the human capital theory applied to the two genders, yes. let's say so. So given that, it's normal that there is a gender wage gap between men and women. Becker brought this kind of stuff in the 50s. He started in the 50s when he started to, you know, introduce it along with Mincer, human capital theory, and then he applied this human capital theory to gender issues, to, particularly to discrimination in the labor market in the 60s. Then he went on and tried to explain household production, household consumption, and so, and the economy of the family by adopting rational choice theory. So the idea is that there is a division of labor between men and women within the family. How is it possible to explain this division of labor and also this division of time, the split between men and women regarding the choice of time within the family, within a household? Um, so it basically uh, introduced this idea, which is related with rational choice theory. Rational choice theory uh, and means that any single agent, economic agent, has uh, its own utility function. This utility function is supposed to be uh, maximized. If the utility function is maximized, the, the choice 
is rational and the outcome is efficient. And at the end of these efficient uh, outcomes, we can get, we can reach out and at a finite point. So in order to study the household economics and the economics of the family, it's important, according to Becker, to apply rational choice theory to the, the household and the members of the uh, family. So uh, Becker introduced one single utility function for the household. But the household is made by several members. So he decided that the utility function of the household should be expressed by the utility function of the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. uh, because the breadwinner is supposed to be the one who is much more educated. So who is the breadwinner according to, to Becker? Is the husband slash father the male figure? Yeah. Uh, why? Because uh, of the combination of the you know human capital theory and also some biological uh, differences. So the combination, this combination, is the following: men are much more educated traditionally than women, so it's much more efficient for them to devote their time and their efforts in the labor market. Women are much more, are, are much less educated than men. So it's much more efficient to dedicate their time and their efforts in the household, taking, by taking care of the family, of the, the house and so forth. The biological uh, part is that men are you know, the, there are biological differences between men and women. And, but not just because women give birth mm -hmm. to children, but also because in their, uh, af their psychological attitude is much more prone to, to give, to provide care and love. While the psychological attitude of men is much more oriented to be competitive, to struggle for survival and so forth. So this combination of biological differences and human capital theory has led to this division of labor between men and women in the household and outside the household in the marketplace. So this division of labor, which is the traditional Western family, um, is efficient. So this is the, uh, this also implies uh, on the second, you know, the stance that the maximization of a utility function for men is outside the house, mm. is in, in, the, in the labor market. Why? The maximization of the utility function of a, and a woman is within the household by, again, taking care of the, of the kids, of the family, and, and so forth. And... This division of labor has, as it, the effect of this division of labor is the efficiency of the household. Okay? Yeah. So the household is like a fur in an industry. The industry is, is the society. And uh, we can also, Becker also applied the theory of compar comparative advantages within the household. So if men are, have a competitive advantage in getting a job outside the household, while women have a competitive advantage in providing care. So the theory of competitive advantages tell, uh, tells us that there's the need to change this. So it's a kind of justification of the, of the rationale with the, uh, this uh, division of labor, this traditional division of labor. And of course, also the education of the kids is a consequence of this division of labor. So it's much more efficient for, um, for according to Becker, to invest um, on some kind of education, job oriented for, for boys, and in another kind of education, much more oriented towards, you know, taking care of health and so forth, the same sectors for girls. And that's the application, very, very briefly, and very realistically, the application of rational to choice theory to Becker's uh, theory of the family or the economics of the family. And just 
I'm guessing here. Bega would call that a positive analysis, not a normative. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Positive analysis uh, of the uh, division of labor within the household. Yeah. So, and the division of labor between men and women. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's, uh, if you don't mind, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the modern critiques to that, maybe. Yes. So, for instance, one of the things that, that's come up recently in, in debates is that there's this theory going around saying that women carry a lot of mental load in the work family. They have to, like, plan for the birthdays and, you know, make sure you book holidays and time and, you know, do they have the right rain clothes for the kids, they, yes. all that kind of stuff. Um, is that something that calculates into Baker's rational choice model or is that a an actual challenge to it, if it's true? Oh, you can add these, uh, let's say, tasks, yeah. additional tasks to the, the, the you get the function. Yeah. And absolutely, you can add the, everything that you want to add into the utility function of the household. Uh, so, um, but this is not the, the most important critique. No. Uh, we're doing critique to Becker's, Becker's theory. I just started somewhere. Like, yes, that's absolutely, that's absolutely, that's absolutely that's yes. That's but everything that you can, any single, uh, you know, ad, any additional quantity of labor requires a, a might be added to the utility function yeah. of the household. Yeah. So does not imply that the model is not going to work. Okay. The model event, the model, Becker's model always works. <laughs> it always works. Yeah. If there are some problems, these problems are before the model, the yeah. assumptions, oh. the methodological assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're also the people who are in the utility function might not have clear communication and all that other stuff. Yes, that's that's people. another yeah. that's another problem. As yeah. I mentioned, the, the the methodological assumption of the utility function of the household is supposed to be the same of the breadwinner. Yeah, but the the problem is that the breadwinner. I mean, there is two kind of problem. It's very it's impossible to add u- different utility function in order to get just one unique yeah. utility function. That's why Becker said, okay, let's use the utility function of the breadwinner as if this is the Friedman's um, methodological uh, uh, assumption, as if it is the household utility function. And then he, add, he added that we have to suppose that this ET, the breadwinner is benevolent. Yeah. All right, yeah, so he shares. So we- he is able either to reward good behaviors of the other members of the family or to punish, yeah. actually, the, the bad behavior of the other members of the family. This is the theory of the rotten kid. Yeah. So that's a, a, a methodological assumption, or basically two methodological assumptions, which might be very problematic because, yeah. you know, it's not always true that the head of the family, the breadwinner, is benevolent. No. First. Second. This idea of being benevolent is quite different from the traditional um, description of the economic agents who are supposed to maximize their utility function, as mentioned before. So they are supposed to be selfish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, the, these are the main critique. But couldn't it be solved by saying that being selfish? It's also caring about your family if you have a preference for it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. This, is the, this, this would have been Becker's answer. Yeah. So um, altruism might be a form of self-relation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Absolutely. That is something that my students have a hard time understanding of uh, and teach. Yeah, but that's, it's, that's absolutely possible. And this is precisely what Becker uh, underlined, for example, in his Nobel Prize lecture. He, he, he even said that... Uh, in a very popular uh, article in 19, published in 1962, that irrational behavior might be explained in a rational way. Okay. Because, because if you have some motivation who might be completely irrational for the majority of the people, like if you are a sociopath, yeah. for example, that, that doesn't mean that you are not maximizing your utility function. Of course. Of course. So I can see, I, I buy a lot of this argument. So for instance, also, one debate is whether taxes transfer to women or to men and so on. And, and if you are the main breadwinner, you're sort of like, you know, it's not just the men getting it for the benevolent, it also goes to your family and, and so on, right? So even tax cuts for the for the, the higher earners would, would tend to benefit both. Um, but wouldn't there be a feminist argument saying that 
this is actually just describing structuralism and it's actually an oppressive, it's the defense of an, an oppressive regime. Yes, many feminist economists, uh, especially the first generation of feminist economists uh, which were working in the late 70s, mm-hmm. 80s, they insisted on the fact that Becker was uh, simply describing, trying to find a way to justify the patriarchal system. Yeah. Because this is the traditional, uh, you know, description of the Western uh, families, but, but also in other places uh, of the world. I mean, we have the breadwinner, we have the, the man and, and everything, and everyone is subjected to his will. Um, so yes, definitely the, some feminist crit- uh, eco- economists criticize the ideological, they, they put on the table some ideological uh, motivations, while some others, put on the table some methodological issues as I mentioned before. Uh, all of them uh, underline the fact that this kind of description of Baker, like any other description provided by mainstream economics, uh, is a kind of universal description. Mm. So it might be applied everywhere and any time. But uh, this is not the case for uh, for example, gender discrimination. And this is not the case when we talk about the condition of women. The condition of women and the condition of the families is different if we are talking about the family today oh, yeah. in Italy or in the United States or today in, uh, I don't know, Yemen or yeah. Afghanistan. The condition of, of uh, an Italian or an American woman and then the family is different if we are talking about today or 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Oh, yeah. Also, some uh, some other cultural and religious aspects are very important. The condition of a woman within a very strict religious community is different from her neighbors, mm-hmm. uh, which it does not belong, who does not belong to the same strict community and so forth. Everything, all these um, cultural, let's say so, elements are not included in the, in Becker's model. So this is the main cri- the main critique of the feminist economics. Besides the ideological part, which is much more, you know, uh, presented by uh, Marxist or so socialist feminist yeah. economists. So they they criticize the capitalistic system as a whole and the, and capital and they saw capitalist capitalism and patriarchy as two sides of the same coin. But there are some, but there are many feminist economists who are not socialists, who are classical liberals, so on. And they put on the table the fact that it's important to add yeah. these cultural uh, elements. So, and, so Baker is like the coal, the yes. cooling stone, then you add the others. Yes, the and yeah. to be yeah. honest, all many Becker's followers yeah. who are totally mainstream, they realized that there are some faults uh, in some methodological force in, in, in Beckers, and so they mm, provided it for a, a development of yeah. the model in, in a much more realistic uh, perspective. Cool. So I, I'll, I'll try to challenge him then a little bit. Maybe going back, this is probably related to the human capital part of the argument. So I'm 41 years old now, okay. and my generation of men were the first men who grew up with, with women who knew that would, they didn't need a man to get pregnant. And in fact, in welfare states like Denmark, the government funds a, an, exemi- an, an insemination, uh, even though you're single, right? So you can become a solo mom. Does that impact the idea, like the, the, the technologically possibility that you don't really need the sole breadwinner to be a man in order to have a family? Would that impact this? Uh, well, this is another cultural element yeah. of much more than technical. Of course, of course. But that's, it, seems yeah, that's... Be, it seems to be technical, yeah. right? It's very cultural. And uh, you mentioned Denmark. Mm-hmm. Denmark is, uh, I mean, it's a special example, like Scandinavian yeah. countries. But yeah. in the rest of the world, you can't do that. What mm-hmm. you just mentioned. Yeah. So, but Becker uh, would have said that. Okay, let's suppose that women are getting their own independence, uh, not just in the marketplace, but even in the fertility market. Yeah. Let's in say the fertility so. market, right? Like yeah. they don't have to yes. have the trade-off of a horrible right. husband, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, so what's going on? when they, they, they get their um, independence. 
uh, the freedom to choose without a, a further budget constraint, yeah. <laughs> a higher budget constraint, higher let's budget. say. So, yeah. Well, what's going on is that the fertility rate is going to decrease. Uh, divorce is going to increase eventually. The rate of marriage is going to increase. And so this is what happened actually in the 60s. And when the, the pill was introduced, the divorce was introduced uh, almost everywhere in Western countries where there wasn't there were there was not allowed yet, and so forth. So it's the same argument right. uh, that Becker used when, uh, in the sixties, uh, women started to to get their own um, independence by being much more educated and then getting into the marketplace. And it, this is the same. Yes. It's the same principle. Well, if in the fertility market, if you don't have, you don't need. Uh, a donor, so, <laughs> yes, so because yes, oh, yes. you just need the donor because the welfare state is providing it to you. Yeah, um, it's it's much easier for for uh, women to 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 think about the possibility to raise a, ch a child or some children by her by themselves. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's a kind of budget constraint that um, is going to decrease, and so it's 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 another equilibrium point. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting argument not to go down that road, but I actually think there are many, potentially there, maybe not many, but potentially there's a pool of, of men out there that could be good fathers, but they're not good mates, so they never get the chance now, right? I mean, because the equilibrium point changes, right? Yes. That's basically the argument, as I understand Absolutely, it, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. But his argument, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming to, to speak as Becker was. Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. Uh, but for example, some critiques, uh, yeah. they might say, okay, the fertility market is changing because the welfare state is providing donors and it's providing yeah. sperms yeah. for free or for a very yeah. cheap, yeah. Trend, yeah. Let's yeah. cheap yeah. Uh, price and whatsoever. And then, for example, the, 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 the feminist economists would have said, okay, but fertility rate does not depend only on the, a utility function. It's, it also depends on something that you can't measure which is love, for example, something that is not rational uh, in in the in the economics terms. Let's say so. And even if my utility fashion is going to be decreased by having the burden of, 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 a, of a partner, of a male partner, I still am choosing to have a, a male partner yeah. because uh, I love him. For yeah. example, there. Back in would have answered, okay, we can introduce this. Love, Love. let's say <laughs> so, but this is, I mean, this is another, another, another way to increase your sibling fund yeah. because you want yeah. someone to share the responsibility and uh, yeah. uh, of raising a child. So it's a kind of a never-ending story. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. That's it. Perfect. Let's move on a little bit. This is really insightful. So is this the is this basically the idea that you review in your, in your paper on this uh, conference, uh, Vegas Classical Liberalism on Gender Issues? So reflections are these. Yes. Or, or there are other things that... No, the, the paper is uh, basically on uh, gen, uh, on Becker's, uh, Becker's ideas, uh, uh, Becker's contribution on gender issues. And my idea is, is the following. Um, is this way of describing uh, family, the economics of the family and the division of labor between men and women is really a classical level of way of describing... Um, um, oh, better say, it's really a classical liberal stance. What I mean is that you are implying that women are maximizing their utility function in providing love and men in providing, you know, income. Income, yeah. Let's say so. Where's freedom here? Oh, yeah. It's a very static model. Yeah. How about women who really don't care? about providing love, about being mothers. How about men, which is different, who are willing to, let's say, stay at home? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Reverse the roles. Yeah. Yes, to reverse the roles. So the idea of classical liberalism is that we are all equals, regardless of gender, mm -hmm. ethnicity, and so forth. Yeah. So this division of labor, which is efficient and leads us to the general economic equilibrium within the family is really 
an idea that is grounded on individual freedom as we know it, mm. as we classical liberals know it. So that's my point in, in my paper. Oh, no, interesting. Uh, so let's, um, so I'm going to do reverse the order of the questions a little bit. We'll bit yeah, sure. So if we move on a little bit, so the term feminist econ economics, you, you have used it a lot already now, and it's certainly gaining in popularity, particularly outside of economics. Yes. Uh, and you wrote a whole book on this, right? Um, a history of feminist and gender economics. So, would you introduce the topic to our leaders? Because I think there's a lot of like pop science around this, yes. and and I like you to actually like to okay. the extreme as possible, actually treat this as a, as a real economic topic. So, the book is is a book of on the history of economic thought, yeah. history of economics. The division is between feminist and gender economics. Yeah. Now, now, gender is a label that is applied everywhere, even to feminist issues. But my idea is that, first of all, if we think about feminism, what is feminism? Feminism is the process of the emancipation of women. Um, feminists started within the tradition of classical liberalism, not within the tradition of socialism. No, that's just the, the combination of the socialism and feminism started much later. So the first chapter is all about the roots of a feminist within the classical liberal tradition. Then at a certain point, at the beginning of the last century, women got some rights, okay? Including the uh, possibility to get enrolled in uh, university and colleges. So they got finally the, their PhD and they became professors, including were economics professors. So they started their, uh, this, their career. Many, many, not old, women, women economists of the time started to, to publish and to write about gender inequality because that was their, you know, subject. Of course, the thing that they, they, they were, that, you know, no better. And so within the academia, we had uh, the rise of the so-called household economics. So the economics of the family. That happened between the two world wars. And um, after the Second World War, this is in the second chapter. So the rise of household economics within the academia. The, the following chapters are about uh, Becker's contribution, which is gender economics, or better say, gender neoclassical economics, which means the application of neoclassical economics, rational choice theory, general economic equilibrium to the economics of the family. And then there was the reaction of feminist economists against Baker's approach. So they started to criticize Baker at, at the very beginning that it happened, as I mentioned before, in the late 70s, early uh, 80s. At the very beginning, they were not feminist economists. They were feminists. And they were economists, regular economists, let's say so. And then Becker got the Nobel Prize in the uh, early 90s because um, of the, of, I think, extended economic behavior to non-economic sectors, mm. such as family. So these critiques of uh, Becker's approach to gender issues decided to, to label this themselves officially as feminist economists. So they, they um, founded the International Association of Feminist Economics. They found in 1992, they founded the, economic, uh, the academic journal Feminist Economics in 1995. And they, at the, a few years later, they got a gel code. The gel code is the classification uh, of provided by the American Economic Association for Research Fields. And they got the gel code in B, which belongs to heterodox approaches. So this is the story of, ge of gender issues within the history of economic thought. So starting from families in the 19th century within the classical liberal tradition, the introduction, introduction of gender issues within academia basically thanks to women economists, the first women economists at the time, Becker's uh, 
Becker's treatment of gender issues, the reaction against Be Becker. Oh, cool. So if you were to, uh, uh, to pick some main insights from this line of thought, especially like the modern version of it, like from the journal onwards and so on, are there anything that are particularly noteworthy for more mainstream economics, since this is qualified as a heterodox view, right? Well, what's happening now is that they, to be hot, I mean, as I mentioned before, many Becker's followers realized that there were some methodological and also some ideological, uh, some methodological faults and some ideological stances that were problematic, let's yeah, say yeah, so. Yeah. So they, they, mm, they just, yeah. some, some, for example, they introduced exogenous, and they, sorry, endogenous preferences. Yes. They introduced the, the role of law. They introduced the cultural framework uh, somehow. And um, it's always great when economists try to model love. That's just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and some feminist economists, they they are now, especially now, they are less, you know, against this uh, this uh, yeah. model. Um, so the, somehow in the na in the in the past twenty fifty, let's say ten fifteen years, the two um, research fields they are converging somehow. Oh. They are converging in a milder position, mm -hmm. let's say so, which is not Becker's and not the against Becker, totally against Becker, as it was 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, in fact, if, if, if you look at the papers posted by on yeah. feminist economics in the journal, yeah. you can find both. Okay. And I think that the, this has been made possible for two reasons. First of all, that was a, ch a, a, a change of a generation. So younger generation of both uh, gender economists and feminist economists are less, you know, uh, angry yeah. against each other, let's yeah. say so, first. And also the other one, or the other reason, which is much more technical, is the application of empirical studies. The application of empirical studies have been enormously developed oh, yeah. in the last, 20 years, and these, those are tools which might be used uh, by, in a mainstream framework as, as well as any non-mainstream framework, but they can converge uh, and, and, and explain phenomena in a, in a different way. Yeah. And, the, and another thing is that gender inequality, of course, is, is um, something that is considered um, inefficient mm -hmm. by books. Oh, yeah. So this idea that the gender inequality is actually inefficient because we have data, we have the empirical studies that showed that when you have um, inequality, gender inequality in this case, you have also inefficiency. So um, okay. that's why they are, for these reasons which are different and you know, but the two approaches are now uh, converge, even though there are so many feminist economists still uh, who still want to be uh, absolutely different from from, from uh, yes uh, gender economists yeah. in general. Interesting. So, so today, we... sorry, uh, no, no, no. Today, from from uh, an official in the, the official the actual <laughs> label of gender economics is the economics of gender. Yeah, they can, they economics can... of gender. Yeah, yes. I love that. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's, see. I know this is going to be uh, hard to do, but let's see, uh, you, you're probably the best person in the world to try to do this at least. So if we were to get Baker back to life and he looked at this whole new identity politics and wokeness sweeping uh, business, academia, the whole society, what do you think he would take away from that? Well, that's, that's a tricky question. Yeah. First of all, I'm not Becker, of course. I'm not, I have no title no, to speak no. for him, but... Uh, like the quintessential... Yeah, I, might say, say, yes, I might say that uh, this is a... Okay, what, what's, the, what's the point of this wokeness mm. movement to avoid discrimination? Mm. Let's put it in this way. Yeah. So Becker wrote a lot about discrimination. Oh, yeah. And uh, not just gender discrimination, but about discrimination in, yeah. for ethnicity and, and so forth. So... According to Becker, you can add, you can change preferences. Mm -hmm. If you change preferences, you change the model. You you mo you are modifying the model. Mm -hmm. 
and that but still you can get you can reach an efficient solution yeah so what does it mean to change preferences okay to um to consider acceptable something that yesterday was not acceptable or vice versa so it's a form of discrimination there's no need to push things in that way no. as as we are doing now just but um this is not a matter of economic models i, I mean economic models are rational yeah and this movement is something that is beyond uh, economic mm -hmm. models beyond uh, you know uh, efficiency yeah don't forget that the the first source of efficiency the the first source of economic theory is Adam Smith oh, yeah. uh, the Scottish Enlightenment so the principle of Scottish Enlightenment is that we have to use common sense mm. we have to be not just rational rational came later reasonable mm. human beings oh yeah so it's a matter of it, but it, it Everything, everything that goes towards politics, well, yeah. we have a problem. It's yeah. very hard to find, um, you know, and I see a solution. That I think that Becker would have been absolutely, you know, crystal clear on this. We can check. Okay, it's a matter of discrimination. I know we're already providing you a model of discrimination. So let's change it to this, the preferences and. The equilibrium point is going to be reached. I like so. Uh, I like that. What 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 do worry me, however, if we take the identity politics part of it, because a lot of that agenda seems to be anti-rational first, right? It seems yeah. to be that you don't individuals don't make rational choices. They there's they're born into structures that predefines the outcomes, and you know uh, whoever comes up with those structures, I never quite understood, but whatever. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah um, so it is like an attack also on the foundation, right, of, of Baker's thought, right? Uh, yeah. Well, not only on Baker's thought, but in general on this uh, Western um, Western philosophical framework, yeah, which is apparently the origin of everything that is going wrong, and uh, and yes, yeah. it's the source of racism, it's the source of uh, discrimination, which is it's. It's simply not true. It's simply not, it's uh, not because, because true we have discrimination and racism even outside the Western society. Oh yeah, and we had it before. And if anything, if anything, we have less of it, right? So, yes, yeah. it's the same thing that we when we talk about capitalism and uh, patriarchy, and for example, there are many scholars who claim that patriarchy uh, is supposed to be destroyed when capitalism is going to be destroyed. Because they are again, as I mentioned before, the same size, uh, the two sides of the same coin. And every time that I heard this, I said, "Well, I know the patriarchal system was present in the humanity, in the human history, way before capitalism. Oh, yeah. Everywhere, way before capitalism. And this is the same. It's it, this uh, I, identity politics is something that is not rational. So, so we can't, you know, adjust something." Uh, which is not, which does not belong to the, that, that set of values. And, um, uh, but this is another way uh, of, of, of thinking. If we go back to discrimination, again, it's very simple. In, Becker, in, in Becker's uh, model, you, you change preferences and you, you can embed, yeah. let's say, uh, this discrimination in the model and you can solve it. Cool. So one last question, and this is going to sound weird to the, to the listeners, but you wrote a paper on this, so that's what yeah. I'm just going to ask. Who was Martha S. Brown? Martha Brown was an, a woman economist, mm -hmm. an Austrian economist. Oh, those are rare. Very rare, but they are rare because they have been forgotten. Oh. And so there was an entire generation of uh, women Austrian economists who worked uh, between the two wars, so they were basically the same age of a Hayek. Yeah. They were students of Mises. Uh, they were basically all Jewish. They were women and they were classical liberals. So they followed in Vienna the same faith of Mises. Mises was a Jewish as well and he was a classical liberal. Vienna at the time was a, a place where there was a role for classical liberals. You were either a, a super leftist 
the Red Vienna yeah. or a fascist. So Mises never got a position, an official position in in, uh, in Vienna during the time. But he ran these private seminaries. Mm. So there, there were many women economists who wrote very important papers and, book, and books. All of them were forced to emigrate to leave uh, Austria in, during, after the Anschluss, of course. Some of them mm -hmm. were... Mm -hmm. And able to find an academic position in the United States, some others not. Martha Brown uh, wrote a very important book published in 1929 about the foundation of economic policy. So this, I, the, Martha Brown was one of the first who uh, wrote, um, who applied Menger's theory to economic uh, policy. Oh, cool. uh, so she wrote that it's economic policy is not a matter of politics. It's a matter of, it, it's a theoretical issue. So any economic policy agenda is supposed to be based on, an, on a valid economic theory. She was of course influenced by the discussion on, um, by two discussions. The first uh, on, uh, was about the monetary uh, policy after the First World War, and the second discussion was a, the, about the feasibility of a planned economic uh, system. So socialist calculation so, debate. Socialist yeah. calculation yeah. debate. So, uh, so the, the main contribution of Martha Brown was this book that was, abs that was praised by the most important economists at the time, such as uh, Robbins, uh, uh, of course Mises, uh, uh, but also some others in Italy, like in Aldi and, and, and so forth. Of course, the book is in German, it's still in yeah, German. Uh, and then she wrote some other articles on uh, monetary policy, basically. So she was forgotten. She was forgotten uh, and her, her fate was the same of her, you know, colleagues, women yeah. colleagues, female colleagues. And I wrote this paper because I was working on the women Austrian school economists of the time. Yeah. And so I, I thought that it was worthy to let my peers know cool. about Martha Brown. Yeah, yeah. It's like, that's a wonderful story. Um, and you're saying there's others like her that we have forgotten? There's more stuff to Oh, yes, there are yeah. many. Um, Ger I, 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 Gertrude Lovasi, yeah. uh, Louis Zollmer. Uh, is uh, means uh, um, so many, many oh, more. at least wonderful. a dozen. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. not wonderful that they were forgotten, but it's wonderful that we can we find them. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you so much. This has been really enlightening, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm very excited to release this to our audience. I think I, I certainly learned a lot, so uh, I, I hope they will soon. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us exploring the history of economic thought. You are welcome to email comments and suggestions to stefan at cpas.dk. Please like and share and recommend this podcast anywhere you can and think it's relevant. Until next time, stay rational. Mm -hmm.